This video is brought to you by Mubi, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. Get a whole month free at mubi.com slash broeydechanel. It was the slam heard around the world. Hall of Fame wrestlers Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant have been fighting each other since before the WWF ever came into existence. Over the years, the two developed a solid friendship and even tag-teamed their matches from time to time. But throughout the early 80s, a series of tensions unfolded between them. A stiff handshake from Andre at Hogan's three-year championship anniversary award ceremony, Andre walking off stage as Hogan congratulated him for his much, much smaller trophy a week later, microaggressions that would eventually culminate in a standoff between the once amicable wrestlers. Andre, envious of Hogan's rising fame, had teamed up with their longtime nemesis Bobby Heenan and went over to the proverbial dark side. Or as they say in wrestling, he turned heel. Hogan was devastated. At Piper's Pit, the two stood nose to nose. Andre, flanked by Heenan, ripped Hogan's shirt and crucifix right off his body in front of the crowd. As Hogan stood bleeding from the sheer force of Andre's grip, he knew only one thing. Vengeance. March 29th, 1987, to an in-person audience of 93,000 and a broadcast audience of millions, Hogan and Andre stepped into the ring to settle their feud once and for all. After about 10 minutes of what looks to be a losing battle for Hogan, with multiple failed attempts to beat Andre down, he summoned all the strength within him, or hulked up, miraculously lifted Andre over his head, whose gigantism set him at over 500 pounds, and body slammed him to the ground. The crowd was thunderstruck. Never before had such a feat been witnessed in professional wrestling history. Hogan, the golden boy, had defeated the greatest villain of wrestling at that time, the undefeatable Andre the Giant. It was the irresistible force versus the immovable object. It was David versus Goliath. It was justice. Of course, it's common knowledge by now that wrestling is, for the most part, more performance than it is sport, the theatrics of which are so over the top that any rational adult could surmise its falseness. As philosopher Roland Barthes characterized in his 1957 book Mythologies, wrestling is a sum of spectacles. So why do audiences continue to watch it? Why do they continue to be shocked by heel turns, cry triumphant at underdog victories? Barthes has an answer. What the public wants is the image of passion, not passion itself. There is no more a problem of truth in wrestling than in the theater. In both, what is expected is the intelligible representation of moral situations which are usually private. Wrestling presents us the story of good and evil in its most stripped down form. The success of the Hogan-Andre match, which generated $10 million in pay-per-view revenue, is a perfect example of this. Andre, a villain with wavering morals, inflated ego, and the biological advantage of extreme strength, is overthrown quite literally by Hogan, the Lidler, athletic, honorable, all-American hero. Wrestling is primal. There's no real judge, jury, bureaucratic bullshit, moral ambiguity. It's trial by combat. While wrestlers demonstrate incredible athletic ability in their stunts, physical skill is not really what matters here. Barth. It is the pattern of justice which matters here, much more than its content. Wrestling is above all a quantitative sequence of compensations, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. This explains why sudden changes of circumstances have, in the eyes of wrestling habitués, a sort of moral beauty. They enjoy them as they would enjoy an inspired episode in a novel, and the greater the contrast between the success of a move and the reversal of fortune, the nearer the good luck of a contestant to his downfall, the more satisfying the dramatic mime is felt to be. Justice is therefore the embodiment of a possible transgression. It is from the fact that there is a law that the spectacle of the passions which infringe it derives its value. Vince McMahon and the WWF knew that despite the public's enjoyment of Andre and Hogan's partnership, what they really wanted was a great story. The sudden change of circumstance, Andre, who had actually agreed to lose the match due to health reasons, turning heel and pushing Hogan's character to his limits, would make Hogan's win that much more impactful. What wrestling provides us is a feeling of controlled chaos and re-established order. It's the ultimate performance of vindication. After all, that's what justice is, isn't it? To be vindicated? Wrestlers sign onto the job with the knowledge that they are playing characters. Audiences above the age of six also sign onto this idea. When a villain loses the game, they leave the ring, take off their mask, and go home. For the most part, there's a comfortable agreement that what we're watching is spectacle. While modern televised wrestling is fairly new to human history, the spectacle of justice is as old as time itself. Justice is a super broad concept that can be described in many ways. 
fairness, equity, righting a wrong, vindication as I said. But in the real world, how do we right a wrong? How do we establish fairness? Western civil society has long evolved past trial by combat. The proper way to settle scores is not with fists. But while the Western world dismisses the supposed primitiveness of this method, relegating it to TV entertainment, its own method can often take on the form of something equally barbarous. Justice in the Western world is understood and practiced as one thing, punishment. A righteous strike against wrongdoers. And while punishment enacted by Western society is not an actual body slam, it can often be equally as spectacular. This video is a precursor for the launch of a podcast I'm releasing with my friend Hannah. The podcast is called Rehash. It's all about recent social media phenomenons that capture our cultural interest only to be quickly forgotten. So we'll be rehashing them as they say. Our first season is called Public Theater, which looks at the way we love the spectacle of creating public villains. We discuss everything from the Try Guys to Taylor Swift to Bad Art Friend. And starting today, we'll be releasing an episode weekly, which you can find on all podcasting platforms. Be sure to check it out. If you look at the trajectory of early modern history, it's clear that the way we punish in Western society has changed significantly over time. Philosopher Michel Foucault traces this timeline in his seminal 1975 book, Discipline and Punish, where he pinpoints the great change in punishment as having occurred between the 18th and 19th centuries. As late as the mid 1800s, monarchies were using public torture as a mode of punishing criminals. Foucault illustrates this by providing a rather graphic description of the torture and execution of Robert-Francois Demiens, a French domestic servant who was convicted of attempted regicide. He recounts that on March 2nd, 1757, Demiens was to be taken into a public square where, and this is not for the faint of heart, in the said cart to the plastic grave, where on a scaffold that will be erected there, the flesh will be torn from his breasts, arms, thighs and calves with red hot pincers, his right hand holding the knife with which he committed the said parricide burnt with sculpture, and on those places where the flesh will be torn away poured molten lead, boiling oil, wax and sulfur melted together, and then his body drawn and quartered by four horses and his limbs and body consumed by fire, reduced to ashes, and his ashes thrown to the winds." Grizzly. In the same way the fighting bodies of Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant physically represent the interplay between good and evil, the harm and pain inflicted on the body of a condemned person was a physical illustration of their guilt, a visible marker of their crime. The body was the site for the state to exercise and demonstrate power. Foucault describes public torture as a gloomy festival of punishment, but this could sometimes have unintended consequences. In punishment as spectacle, a confused horror spread from the scaffold. It enveloped both executioner and condemned, and although it was always ready to invert the shame inflicted on the victim into pity or glory, it often turned the legal violence of the executioner into shame. By inflicting pain upon the condemned and spilling their blood for everyone to see, public tortures could inadvertently expose that person's humanity. According to Foucault, in some instances, it would evoke feelings of sympathy and pity from the audience, who would rally behind the condemned and speak out against the monarchies. Yet, less than 100 years later, Foucault observes criminals were sitting in prisons, with daily schedules that included regimented times for prayer, work, meal, school, work again, supper, work, then sleep. While on the surface this may look more humane, and it's even been argued that the change was driven by humanitarian motives, Foucault takes a different stance. The only reason public torture was phased out of practice, he argues, was because prisons made it easier for sovereigns and later governments to consolidate their control over the people. Torture was messy. Prisons were orderly, centralized, and hidden from public view. And so it was easier to eliminate that unpredictable element of humanity. Prisons were designed to strip the condemned of their humanity so there would be no sympathy for them. The reason Foucault doesn't see prisons as any more humane than public torture is because both were enacted for the same reasons power and control. Only one of them was better at hiding it. Both were a means of subjugation, the punishment just took on a different form. 
But where sovereigns enforced public torture with an almost gleeful eagerness, the state was meant to do it hesitantly. It is ugly to be punishable, but there is no glory in the punishing. Do not imagine that the sentences we judges pass are activated by a desire to punish. They are intended to correct, reclaim, cure. A technique of improvement represses, in the penalty, the strict expiation of evil doing and relieves the magistrates of the demanding task of punishing. But is that really true? In the modern Western justice system, the United States in particular, harsh sentencing does seem to have a lot of glory in it, doesn't it? Especially in criminal cases that represent landmarks of major social progress, glory makes itself very present. Just look at this ruling by Judge Rosemary Aquilina in the conviction of Larry Nassar. Our constitution does not allow for cruel and unusual punishment. If it did, I might allow what he did to all of these beautiful souls, these young women in their childhood, I would allow someone or many people to do to him what he did to others. As much as it was my honor and privilege to hear the sister survivors, it is my honor and privilege to sentence you. I'm giving you 175 years, which is 2,100 months. <laughs> I've just signed your death warrant. What Judge Aquilina is practicing here is what they call in the world of law, retributive justice. In saying she would like to have what Nassar did to his victims done right back to him, but instead will have to settle for a life sentence in prison, Aquilina is calling for retribution. Phrased in Latin as lex taxalinus, or the law of retaliation, and in the Bible as an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. This is a philosophy of justice that has been practiced in the Western courts for a very long time and propagated by a number of prominent political thinkers, most significantly by Prussian philosopher Immanuel Kant. In his 1797 work, The Metaphysics of Morals, Kant presents a theory that sees punishment as both the means and the end of justice. The end is not about deterring people from committing crimes. It's about exacting a punishment against an individual that is completely equal to the crime they committed, which will restore the balance of society. None other than the principle of equality and the position of the needle on the scale of justice to incline no more to one side than to the other. Whatever undeserved evil you inflict upon another within the people that you inflict upon yourself. If you steal from him, you steal from yourself. If you strike him, you strike yourself. You played yourself. In lesser words, the punishment fits the crime. Kant's theory underscores the general ethos of retributive justice, that punishment should be proportionate to a crime, no less or no more. This wasn't exactly new when he theorized it. Inflicting suffering onto a condemned person for the suffering they caused to others was the guiding principle for most types of state enforced punishment. It was only that Kant justified it within the more civilized context of the modern court systems. There are many arguments to be made against retributive justice. My personal favorite is espoused by Judith Butler, who in a book titled Giving an Account of Oneself, brilliantly takes down the concept of ethical violence. She uses the analogy of Franz Kafka's short story, The Judgment, where a bereaved father sentences his son to death by emitting a force which sends the son flying towards a bridge and plunging into the depths of the water below. Butler sees the father's powerful condemnation of his son as symbolic of judgment in a broader sense. If condemnation does seek in the extreme to annihilate the other, then it not only quite obviously destroys the conditions for autonomy, but erodes the capacity of the addressed subject for both self-reflection and social recognition. Two practices that are, I would argue, essential to any substantive account of ethical life. It also, of course, turns the moralist into a murderer. In simpler terms, Butler is saying that violent condemnation doesn't actually promote any true social progress, since it offers the condemned person no opportunity for reflection or change. All it serves to do, as she says, is turn the moralist into a murderer. Or like Foucault says, shame envelops the executioner and the condemned. Butler. Many atrocities are committed under the sign of self-defense, that precisely because it achieves a permanent ethical justification for retaliation, knows no end and can have no end. Such a strategy has developed an infinite way to rename its aggression as suffering, and so provides an infinite justification for its aggression. When I read this, I think a lot about Shakespeare's tragedy Titus Andronicus. Titus has been characterized as a revenge play in that the sequence of events is driven by a process of retaliation, where a character wrongs another character and then seeks vengeance upon them. 
The characters, Titus, a Roman army general, and Tamora, queen of the Goths, and their respective families, engage in this bloody back and forth for so long that in the end, everybody ends up dead, no one wins, and in this grisly aftermath, it's no longer clear who was more wrong. I think this applies well to retributive justice. When harsh punishments against condemned people, ones that either literally take their life in the form of death sentences, or ones that strip them of their humanity in the form of life sentences, are enacted by the state, does that make the state any more morally good? Why is taking a life legal in one sense and not in the other? Again, it comes back to power and control. The United States, with its particularly punitive and inhumane penal system, is most exemplary of this. There's the existence of the life sentence, where someone can go to prison for the remainder of their natural life without the possibility for parole, and the sentence could be stacked onto itself so that people like Larry Nassar end up with 175 years in prison. In 1972, the Supreme Court tried to abolish the death penalty, with a majority ruling that it was considered cruel and unusual punishment, and therefore unconstitutional, but then the public was like, no, we still want that. This was in the period that Nixon and the Republicans were waging their war on crime, so people were very much in favor of harsher penalties. The states were also classically in favor of small government, which is ironic given that the state has a right to take a life there. And so they rejected the idea that the feds could enforce this upon them. So 37 of the 50 states actually reenacted the death penalty. Some even tried unsuccessfully to make it the automatic penalty for capital murder. And while we can all sit and blame this on the Republicans, the Dems under Bill Clinton doubled down on it during their tough on crime campaigns, with Clinton attending an execution for good press in his 1992 run, and Biden pushing legislation that would speed up the execution process, though he's since changed his mind on this. And then there's the entire prison industrial complex, where many predominantly black activists, scholars, and civil rights groups caught onto the fact that a great number of businesses were gaining a financial profit from the American prison system. What this exposed was that both these businesses and the government have a vested interest in imprisoning as many people as possible, whose bodies fill the prisons, produce free labor, and thus contribute to the profit margins of very rich individuals. So you get pretty suspicious when, during the war on drugs, the government placed an almost obsessive focus on incarcerating marginalized people, mostly impoverished black and brown men who were easy to villainize to the general public due to America's long roots in white supremacy, and easy to target because their vulnerable communities are so over-policed. So yeah, America's system of punishment is not only deeply corrupted, it's bloodthirsty. But this isn't a partisan thing. As I said, it can also be clear in emotionally charged cases that present a sort of landmark in social progress. In an article for The Baffler titled Who Keeps Us Safe, Maya Hibbett does an excellent job of pointing to the contradictions between modern social progress movements and their pursuit of justice through the penal system. Using Me Too as an example, she argues that the movement has taken on a very bizarre form of what she calls carceral feminism, where the end goal of many high-profile assault cases is to see perpetrators locked behind bars. Calling back to prison abolitionists like Angela Davis and Beth Ritchie, she postulates, mainstream feminism assumes that women's safety can only be secured through the tools of state violence and oppression, thus furthering racial and class disparities as unseemly byproducts of the feminist movement. This is because the harsh sentencing in high-profile cases like Weinstein and Nassar have a very serious trickle-down effect onto convicted people in the prison system, most of whom are black and brown people who disproportionately make up the population of people locked up. It's strange that after finding out that Harvey Weinstein got COVID in prison, we progressives cheered rather than questioned the conditions that led to prisons being infected with the virus and how if this happened to Weinstein, this would adversely affect much less powerful inmates. Hibbett also argues that the system is particularly unforgiving with sex offenders, who are forced to sign onto a registry for life. She argues that the registry is a unilateral narrative approach that blurs a complex range of sex offenses into a mass of horror and disgust, which results in a public that's hungry for harsher and harsher punishments. Because of this, the system overreaches and increases the surveillance apparatus that most harshly targets the most marginalized people in the country. When we discuss Brock Turner's ruling of a life placement on the registry and six months in jail plus three years probation, we classify it as just a slap on the wrist. Of course, seeing the injustice of Turner getting a much shorter sentence versus all of the marginalized men who received significantly harsher punishments for lesser crimes and even crimes they didn't even commit, our default was not to question why a system would be so cruel and punitive towards the marginalized, it was to call for harsher punishments for Turner. It was retribution. As Hibbett puts it, 
These wrathful moments are supposed to make victims feel better, because in the United States, vengeance and justice are synonymous. High-profile criminal cases in the US involve a great deal of theatrics. The media and the public play a very strong hand in shaping the narrative around a case. After all, criminal trials are first and foremost a competition in who can sell the most compelling narrative. Sometimes public opinion has an overwhelming role in the outcome of a case. What the media circus around judicial punishment really tells us is that modern justice, as evolved as we like to say it is, is still very wrapped up in public shaming. Sure, we don't all gather around the public square and watch someone get tortured, but I don't think punishment is as hidden in contemporary courts as Foucault thinks it is. And often, a crime doesn't even have to be committed for the punishment of public shaming to take hold. Back in early modern England, there was actually an alternative court system, which dealt with issues outside the purposes of legality. These were called ecclesiastical courts, or church courts. These courts were obviously concerned mostly with religious matters, but they also offered a space for people to air grievances related to personal affairs. Just think of it like Whitney on The Real Housewives of Salt Lake City having to formally disclose the intimate details of her extramarital affair to the LDS church in this really weirdly bureaucratic bid for repentance. In an essay on the church courts, historian Martin Ingram says something really interesting which will become super important later on. Though today we accept the intrusion of the state into our lives on a scale which early modern Englishmen would have regarded as grossly tyrannical, we do assume that moral behavior and religious observances are largely matters not for the public forum, but for private conscience. So these courts adjudicated what we as a public like to think belonged to the dealings of the private sphere, of interpersonal conflict resolution. Another English historian, Laura Gowing, describes the early modern English as a particularly litigious population. The public were encouraged to keep tabs on their neighbors' moral indiscretions, to cast doubt on their reputations, and bring it to the court if they caught someone slipping, basically. In other words, everyone was suing each other. Gowing pinpoints a lack of privacy as a major source of gossip and hearsay in the household and neighborhood. In the permeable boundaries of an early modern English street, everybody's business was everybody's business because it was all out there for everyone to see. According to Ingram, the church courts often initiated proceedings for moral grievances as if they were criminal. Prosecuting a moral dispute wasn't purported to be done with the intention of retribution, but to reform and to restore the soul of the wrongdoer. Yeah, punishments weren't physically gratuitous, but the rehabilitation of the sinner did call for a sort of penance where it was required that the wrongdoer be humiliated in a very public way as a means of deterring other people from sinning. Shame has long been a tactic for public punishment. In fact, it's been a tool of justice in America since the country's inception. Before America won its independence, mob rule was the proud political condition in major cities. Writer James Pogue argues in an essay for The Baffler that patriots during the fight for independence galvanized the masses against anyone who spoke out against parliamentary tax boycotts. Their punishments usually fell along the lines of social banishment, economic ruin, assault, and humiliation all of which were decided by a passionate mob. In one case, Pogue says, a Connecticut doctor was stripped naked, hot liquid poured on his flesh, then carried to a pigsty where he had pig dung rubbed in his face and stuffed in his mouth. It was also during this heated time that people were also encouraged to spy on each other, tattle if they suspected someone of unpatriotic activity, and gather at the courthouse to mock the alleged traitors, their moral crime being that they continued to pay duties to Britain. Now, the concept of justice in these shamings was to out people who were seen as a hindrance to the progress of the country, but Pope postulates that their true goal was for social and political control. The rhetoric of contempt was the most powerful tool at the Patriots' disposal. What better way to terrorize someone into an ideology than to say, hey, this'll be you if you step out of line. But this is pretty at odds with that whole Patriot concept of freedom and liberty, no? Pogue points out, and I'm sure many of you are already familiar with this concept, that slave-owning George Washington and his compatriots were not, in fact, for liberty, justice, and freedom for all. They were for liberty, justice, and freedom for some. But by tapping into the basic psychology of mob rule and the human inclination to shame others, they were able to convince hundreds of thousands of people that they were, in fact, for them. As Pogue puts it, the mob had been carefully controlled, and our long national story, the story of a nation where the rote language of popular liberty has almost always served to protect the interests of oligarchs and businessmen, had begun in earnest. To this day, America is transfixed by the excitement, the zeal that a good public shaming can bring. Much of its entertainment programming carries with it a similar bloodthirstiness to the high-profile cases I talked about earlier. 
It's fascinating to tell someone they did something wrong, and to be able to do it without ever confronting them in person is even better. Look at the venom with which 21-year-old Monica Lewinsky was humiliated for performing a sexual act on the president. Or how Tiger Woods' extramarital affairs were made worthy of national headlines. Or how disgusted we were that Hilaria Baldwin had lied about her nationality. Moral indiscretions of any kind are grounds for the most gleeful, most venomous, and most importantly, most righteous of public shamings. In his 2015 book, So You've Been Publicly Shamed, John Ronson interviews a number of people who have been publicly shamed to get a sense of the harm that it can cause to an individual. What he seems to surmise in almost every case, all of which are concerned with moral indiscretions, is that the harm caused by a public shaming is vastly disproportionate to the harm done by the alleged wrongdoer. These wrongdoers include a writer who plagiarized quotes in his work, a PR woman who wrote what was meant to be a sardonic tweet about AIDS in Africa, and a female tech developer who got a man fired from his job for making an off-color joke about a dongle that she found to be misogynistic. None of which can be considered crimes of any sort, but rather moral failings to one degree or another. But the vitriol against these people was so extreme, it verged on financial and psychological destruction. Ronson finds that the public often makes folk devils out of the publicly shamed, elevates them to the status of cartoonish villains, and refuses any signs of nuance. He says, A shaming can be like a distorting mirror at a funfair, taking human nature and making it look monstrous. Attempts on the part of the shamed to display remorse or apologize are often rejected. Ronson doesn't know what the public wants out of public shaming, other than the total obliteration of a far-off individual. The right to use them as the butt of a joke for all eternity, but to never have to see them again. In my opinion, kind of like how we shove criminals away in prison, away from view. And in both cases, with no chance at redemption. What Ronson achieved with his book is demonstrating that the court of public opinion is extremely powerful. And recently, it's made itself a new, very unwelcoming home. Hey, sister. Both judicial and extrajudicial justice in the Western world, particularly America, take on a very retributive approach. The aim is not to rehabilitate or deter. When we send someone to prison for a crime, or publicly shame someone for a moral indiscretion, or sometimes a mixture of the two, we aren't interested in their redemption. Punishment is the means and the end. But seldom are the words punishment or retribution actually used when this happens. Like Foucault's prisons, the most powerful weapon for control is an invisible one. So the word that's most often used in the place of punishment is accountability. When we punish someone for a crime, we are holding them accountable. When we publicly ridicule someone for deviating outside the standards of morality, we are also holding them accountable. But accountability is very difficult in a world made up of fallible creatures. No one individual is completely morally pure, nor do we get to choose the moral standards imposed upon us. In the same book I discussed earlier, Judith Butler argues that as fallible creatures, human beings are completely incapable of self-transparency. We have no innate understanding of ourselves, but really only come to know who we are, what morals we're supposed to be guided by, through the society around us. So how is it, she asks, that we're expected to place moral judgments on others, to hold others accountable, when we can barely do that for ourselves? She acknowledges that, of course, judgments are necessary from time to time, but posits that not every single ethical relation can be reduced to an act of judgment. In her words, and this is a biggie, so just bear with me for a sec, consider that one way we become responsible and self-knowing is precisely by deferring judgments, since condemnation, denunciation, and exoriation work as quick ways to posit an ontological difference between judge and judged, and even to purge oneself of another so that condemnation becomes the way in which we establish the other as non-recognizable. In this sense, condemnation can work precisely against self-knowledge inasmuch as it moralizes a self through disavowal. Although self-knowledge is surely limited, that is not a reason to turn against it as a project. But condemnation tends to do precisely this, seeking to purge and externalize one's own opacity, and in this sense failing to own its own limitations, providing no felicitous basis for a reciprocal recognition of human beings as constitutively limited. This is a tough quote, but essentially what she's saying is that when we condemn others, we're basically ridding ourselves of our own moral impurities and projecting them onto another person. This really raises the question, who is allowed to judge? Who is allowed to punish? Or better, who is allowed to hold others accountable? When it comes to judicial punishment, it's presumed that the state is an objective, neutral body, which is why it's the only one, along with a jury of unbiased individuals, that's allowed to make a judgment. But as we know, that's 
not exactly the case. As you see with the prison industrial complex, there is an incredible amount of human error and bias at every level in the system, from surveillance technology to cops to judges. And when it comes to extrajudicial punishment, it's presumed that the ones doing the punishing are a morally pure, objectively inclined, homogenous public. But again, this is not the case. This is a public made up of thousands, millions of complicated, fallible individuals. So oftentimes, accountability is not in itself an entirely ethical, morally pure process. What it instead comes down to is the upholding of a society where everyone points fingers at each other and systemic issues are rarely actually figured out. At the beginning of his book, Ronson considers the ways that shaming has been an important tool in social justice movements on the internet. I mean, look at the reckoning that was brought down upon the system of racial profiling and inequality in the US by the Black Lives Matter movement in 2020. There is power in numbers, and social media presents an opportunity for power to finally be placed in the hands of the marginalized. Ronson describes this as the democratization of justice. It's the reason people often react negatively when they hear someone use the phrase cancel culture. This can often be a dog whistle used to devalue and decry much of the social progress made by marginalized groups on the internet. But I do think a nuanced discussion necessitates an acknowledgement that the amplification of a million voices at once is not always a good thing. Even Kant, the father of retribution, made clear the justice against the condemned must be proportional to the crime, which as Ronson's book illustrates, isn't often the case. Okay, what's becoming more and more noticeable online is that the public is starting to use the same language of accountability in all manners of wrongdoings. A public figure can be scrutinized and shamed for anything ranging from sexual abuse and non-consensual texts about their cannibalism kink, to cheating on their partner, to not looking excited enough to see their girlfriend who surprises them at college. In fact, you don't even need to be a public figure to be shamed anymore. Social media, but especially TikTok, has made it so that any regular person can experience virality whether they wanted to or not. Anyone can be the subject of infamy, of body language analyses, media articles debating the details of their personal lives, and even death threats. Why has social media made us even more willing to shame people? Why have the boundaries between crime and moral indiscretion become so blurred? Well, for one, there's an extreme lack of privacy online. Much like the lack of privacy in medieval English households, we are constantly privy to each other's shit. The boundaries between ourselves and others have lowered infinitely, which makes it almost too easy to spy, gossip, and tattle. In a study on moral outrage on the internet, neuroscientist MJ Crockett presents a hypothesis that social media has exponentially increased triggering stimuli. She argues that we live in an attention economy, where old media like news outlets are constantly trying to stay relevant and secure their spots in new media, the internet, by fighting for our attention. We're constantly being bombarded with clickbait headlines that tell us the new thing to be outraged about. A war across the world, what new ridiculous thing our political leader said today, the breakup of our favorite celebrity couple. And what's worse is that new media uses algorithms that incentivize the most outrage-worthy stuff. Just as we get compassion fatigue with all the humanitarian crises we see on the news every day, Crockett argues that social media gives us outrage fatigue, where the sheer ubiquity of spectacles and transgressions have made it much more difficult to figure out a proportionate response. She says, by lowering the threshold for outrage expression, digital media may degrade the ability of outrage to distinguish the truly heinous from the merely disagreeable. So sometimes when we look at a situation, we amplify a perceived harm against a victim and then amplify the perceived crime of the perpetrator. The line between the Harvey Weinsteins and the Ned Fulmers, the Elizabeth Holmes and the Hilaria Baldwins, the Bolsonaros and the Olivia Wilde's becomes blurrier and blurrier. You may think I'm being dramatic, but I actually really don't think I am. And it's not like how it used to be where we can yell our outrage at the TV. Now we can vocalize it publicly. Crockett. Clickbait headlines are presented alongside highly distinctive visual icons that allow people to express outrage at the tap of a finger. Positive feedback for these responses, likes, shares, and so on, is delivered at unpredictable times, a pattern of reinforcement well known to promote habit formation. And just as a habitual snacker eats without feeling hungry, a habitual online shamer might express outrage without actually feeling outraged. So we don't even have to be that angry in person to express anger online. I mean, how often do we actually go up to people and confront them in real life? If you knew someone in your life who cheated on their partner, it's really unlikely that you try to scrap them in the street, call them a bunch of names, and then tell them they should go to jail. Like, maybe, but it's unlikely. And definitely not without consequences. 
Yet the anonymity of the internet makes it very easy to do this from a comfortable distance. Back when they were torturing people in public squares, the public sometimes felt pity and sympathy, right, for the condemned. But we're so far removed from them online that it's much harder to put ourselves in their shoes. Instead, what we tend to do is make people into caricaturish avatars. We turn them into villains to uphold them as the figurehead of all that's wrong with X, Y, Z issue in the world. It's easier for us to justify our judgments against them when we deny their human complexity. And the way wrestlers and their audience agree to an unspoken contract that what the wrestlers are doing is a performance, the same can go, perhaps less obviously, for traditional celebrities. What transpires between figure and audience is a spectacle. The figure helps to contract a spectacle for their audience, and the audience signs on. And the vitriol occurs either when the public feels that the contract has been broken because the figure betrays their persona, or if people in their public don't really understand this contract and enter a parasocial relationship with them, where they feel that their bond is more intimate than it actually is. Celebrities have all the resources at their disposal. Media training, PR teams, image rehabilitation, to cushion them from the vitriol. Their personas keep them at a safe distance from their audience, but sometimes even they get psychologically and even financially crushed by it. So what's a regular person supposed to do? There's this German word that came up a lot in my research for this video. The word is schadenfreude which basically defines the feeling of pleasure we experience from watching the suffering or humiliation of others. A 2019 psychological study found that the experience of schadenfreude has three things that drive it. Aggression, rivalry, and justice. With the justice element being that we enjoy watching someone receive retribution or punishment for a harm they've done. We've treated justice as a form of spectacle for forever. Just as we've used punishment as a means of administering this justice, be that physical torture, incarceration, or just outright shaming. And I think what both the judicial and non-judicial history of punishment has shown is that the forms of punishment human beings in the Western world are drawn to are not ones that promote progress, as much as we like to say they do. When we punish someone or hold them accountable, we're not interested in restoring the balance of society, or using it to analyze the infinite layers of human complexity, or rehabilitating that person and showing them that they have time to grow or change. None of these things are the end. Schadenfreude is the end. It's also the means. Why? Because we like it. We like to punish. Because it brings us a secret, shameful catharsis. People have used altruistic excuses to justify punishment for centuries. But as much as Foucault's prisons would like to have us believe that there should be no glory in punishment, there is. Monarchies, states, and prisons enjoy the catharsis of absolute control. We enjoy the catharsis of people telling us we're right on social media, a feeling like we're morally righteous and good. And really, what we wanted all along was a show. A show that allows us to sit from the stands, quietly feel our schadenfreude, and look like morally upstanding people on the outside. In the heat of the moment, people didn't need to think about the fact that Andre the Giant was a beloved figure in pop culture, that most people who met him said he was hilarious, generous, and thoughtful. In that moment, what they wanted was to see him get body slammed, and in a flicker of vehemence, to never get back up again. This is an ugliness inside all of us that we don't care to admit because that would require holding ourselves accountable. And as Judith Butler famously says, that's more or less impossible. I want to give a shout out to Mubi for sponsoring this video. Mubi is a curated streaming service dedicated to elevating great cinema from all around the globe. It's for lovers of great cinema, and those who don't know they love great cinema yet. Because the beauty of Mubi is that it exposes you to artful, thought-provoking, and innovative films you would never think to watch. One film I really recommend you check out is Firecrackers, a 2018 Canadian drama directed by Jasmine Mazafari and starring Michaela Kurimsky and Karina Evans. It's about two teenage girls desperately trying to escape their repressive Ontario town. Only the dream is quashed when one of them is assaulted by an ex-boyfriend, and the two make the mistake of seeking revenge within a system where justice does not exist for women. 
Firecrackers is a very embodied film, taking you on a journey through the emotions of a woman stifled by her environment. You can find it right now on Mubi as part of their Reframing Women Directors Collection. From iconic directors to emerging auteurs, discover the best of cinema at your fingertips, streaming anytime, anywhere. You can try Mubi free for 30 days at mubi.com slash broeydeschanel. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash broeydeschanel for a whole month of great cinema for free. Special thank you to Louis Osta, Syed Hassan, Malpertui, Morgan, Cooper Stimson, Nina, Nina E, Nadia C, Nick, Jenny Eller, J. Frost McFinnegan, Gabriel M, The Wiz Daniel, D.H. Klein, Pete Holland, Carrie Gavin, and Kelly Wolf for supporting this channel.